Everybody doesn't have a guru or a physical playing guide. Many people have inner guides that they experience as their inner voice, which could be their inner voice or it could be another being helping them. Or There are many levels of this game. Each person gets their karma up and they get just what they need, just when they need it. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Ram Dass Here and Now podcast. This is episode 247, Dreams Within Dreams Within Dreams. I'm Jackie Dobrinska, and I'm really excited to be with all of you, the Ram Dass community, through time and space as we gather here. Thanks for tuning in. This episode was taken from a Q&A session in 1987, and in this one, it seems like Ramdas is not letting us get off the hook by being caught by our habits of mind that we are so often ingrained in. And, you know, it is a Q&A session, and maybe I'm searching too hard for a theme to tie it all together, but I keep hearing this similar thread. Don't get caught by what you think you know. Or said another way, open to the mystery, because there is so much more going on than we can possibly imagine. So we all know how powerful the mind is to shape our perceptions of ourselves, of others, and of the world. And the mind is really efficient too. Um, I'm sure all of us can relate to being caught in some sort of loop. Typically it's a negative loop about ourselves or about someone else. And then it just seems like it keeps getting reinforced. And that's because the mind with its efficiency often won't let in new information that the brain fills in gaps by sort of drawing borders and coloring in the area using what it already knows. But we have these incredible tools that can help get us out of that, to get us present, to help us open to the awe of the mystery and begin to see what is actually true in this moment. And, you know, the yogis and probably all mystical teachings of some sort, they say that the mind is so much more than this rational intellect or even this eye making mas machine, we might call it ego or ashmita. Um, but it has this other part that can uh, tap into the mystery. And, you know, from this plane of consciousness, we can't know the mystery in its totality, which is why it's called the mystery, right? But we can open to it. And the yogis, they call this part of the mind that connected us to this highest truth or the seat of wisdom. They called it buddhi. And those glimpses of the mystery that we get, those intuitive moments that sort of drop down into consciousness, they called that D. The Quakers might have called it um, the still small voice. But how open are we to these flashes of insight, these unexplained miracles, these different planes of reality, these inexplicable recognitions like of the stranger across the crowded room? Or how trapped are we by what we think we already know to be true? And in this episode, Ramdas answers questions about this, about how he and how we can, co can come out of these habits of mind. And he talks about everything from malas and devotion to psychedelics and perspective. In this episode, Ramdas answers questions about how he and how we can come out of those habits of mind talking about everything from malas and devotion to psychedelics and perspective. And he also makes a stab at uh, defining or explaining good versus evil. And then there's this one point in the episode where he points to something that I think is really important for us all to remember on our spiritual, spiritual journeys. And it's this idea of form and formless being two sides of the same coin, that often we get stuck on one side of the coin and think of, for lack of a better word, uh, God, uh, as, you know, it's beyond definition and it carries a lot of um, baggage, but this idea of this force that's bigger than us, um, we often think of it as transcendent, as out there, of something we have to strive towards. And we forget the other side of the coin, which is that sense of imminence, that it's here, that it's in all of it, that it's in the world and that we are not somehow separate from it. And so there's this brilliant line that he gives, and I hope you all catch it, about that topic. 
And I really do wonder, like, how would it change our lives to remember that on a daily basis? How would it change our world? And this is one of the things that Ramdas is so brilliant at. He has spent five decades of his life helping people recover, rediscover this inner resource. You know, he spent five decades pointing us towards this innate freedom that is our birthright and our soul's calling. And he could address the big topics uh, in really brilliant ways. You know, the ones like love and trust and intuition, uh, compassion and courage and relationships and fear and ego and death. And so it's with just so much excitement that we invite each one of you to this new version of our most popular course. It's called Reimagined, The Life and Teachings of Ramdas. And in this one, we focus a lot on his life and how the tapestry of the teachings wove through his life. Um, it's four weeks and it includes archival teachings and meditations and this fantastic lineup of wisdom teachers, including Jack Kornfield, Krishna Das, Mirabai Bush, Jamie Cato, uh, Mir, um, I said Mirabai Bush, Ramdev, Raghu, and then several others that we're excited to introduce you to. So the course begins April 8th and sign up starts next week and we make it available to everyone. So check it out. Go to ramdas.org slash reimagined. And also give your mind a little support along the way with Magic Mind, which is this little green shot of zesty goodness that can really help put us into flow states and give us sustained energy throughout the day. It has many ingredients, including nootropics, which help our brains be more creative. So go to magicmind.com slash Ramdas and get up to 50% your subscription in the next 10 days with the code Ramdas. And as always, we thank our sponsors and our donors because without them, we could not bring you these podcasts. And so if you are not already donating, please do go to ramdas.org slash donate. And also, we really give thanks for the privilege to be able to bring these to you and just acknowledge the privilege we all have for being able to open to this, to be in a place in our lives that we can open to these teachings. And so we dedicate any good, all the good that comes from these teachings to all beings everywhere. May what we learn here ripple out into the world. And with that, here is Ram Das, here and now. Namaste and blessings. Here we go. Uh, this is the question part, and um, when I look at uh, my own journey, I see that one of the things that has helped me the most is having people who would be very straight with me and who would help me. In other words, sharing truth with another human being. It's a very, almost a rare thing to share that kind of truth. Most of us conspire to not push each other's egos too hard. Sort of, I'll make believe who you, that you are who you think you are if you'll make believe I am who I think I am. And it's great fun to finally be with people who will help you get straight, although sometimes it's very, a little painful. Truth is a little painful at times. So I've really decided that as a public person that one of the things I can offer is truth as well as I can do it, no matter how difficult it is to do it publicly. So this is part of that, and I would like to answer any questions you can ask about anything. 
and I'll answer them as straight as I can. And I'll repeat the question if it's not hearable immediately. Questions? Yes. Uh, these are um, their beads. Uh, they're obviously they're. It's called in in Sanskrit. It's called a mala. Um, it's for. It's a centering device, actually. It's a way. What I'm doing is repeating various names of the unnameable, names of God, different names, and uh, at times I'll use one name, and at times another. And the Ram is one that I often use. And there's no name for God because it's beyond name, so it doesn't matter. Any name that's it's like the fingers pointing at the moon. And what happens is, as I'm talking to you, I'll get sort of caught in the in talking, and I'll come out into the action. And then I'll feel the beads in my fingers, and they'll bring me back into my center again. And I use them to keep coming back into that place where I'm perfectly quiet inside. And so I'm talking along, and suddenly I just feel the bead in my finger, and it'll remind me to come back. It just keeps reminding me. It keeps bringing me back into my spiritual reservoir, if you will, from coming out into the world. It's a centering device. Questions? No, Haridas was my teacher. Neem Kareli Baba was my guru. Yeah. My line of teachers? It's not really a line at all. I mean, uh, my line is Hanuman the monkey and my guru, Neem Kareli Baba, and me. I mean, I'm not even part of the line. I don't even know that I'm a disciple. I mean, I just happen to like him, you know. He's probably a dirty old man. I have no idea, really, you know. It's not that kind of a lineage scene, in a way. It's a very deep lineage. It's a lineage of the heart. But my connection is to Hanuman, and Hanuman is in the Hindu tradition, in the Hindu pantheon, that form of relationship to God, which is that of servant to master. In devotional yoga, or in the way of coming to God through the heart, there are many relationships between the devotee and God. There is, for example, like the relation between John and Jesus, or friend to friend. There's the relation between Mary and Jesus, of mother to son. These are all various qualities of devotional yoga. You can see your child like Krishna as a baby, Gopala as a baby, or um, as a lover like Radha and Krishna. And the particular relationship that I'm that I that is part of that lineage is servant to master, if you will, so that God is my master and I just serve and I'm dying into service. There's a great line from um, from um, if you one second from Mahatma Gandhi that says, God demands nothing less than complete self-surrender as the price for the only real freedom that is worth having. Meaning that you, you break out of your identity as a separate entity to realize that you are part of the one. And when a person thus loses herself, she immediately finds herself in the service of all that lives. It becomes her delight and recreation. She is a new person, never weary of spending herself in the service of God's creation. And that's sort of what I'm learning how to do, is just surrender in to be an instrument. This is my yoga, doing this. Yeah, I'm not, this is service, but I'm not doing this actually to serve you. I'm doing this as work on myself. If your karma is your karma. I'm your karma up and send your mine. <laughs> Questions? What did you say? Um, Gandhi didn't actually say she. Gandhi said he. I changed it because most all of the spiritual writings are terribly sexist, and I feel that I have to balance them in my heart so that I can honor that women have as deep a spiritual journey as men do. All right. And some of my greatest teachers are women, uh, spiritual teachers, okay. Questions, yes. Uh, 
uh, drugs. Um, well, the word drugs is a, uh, it's kind of a basket that contains an awful lot of stuff. It contains coffee and cigarettes and tranquilizers and sleeping pills and heroin and opiates and psychedelics or tryptamines. Um, I'm particularly have been interested in the tryptamines, uh, things like LSD and psilocybin, things like that. And some of you have heard that when I went to India, I had taken those many hundreds of times and written books about them as a way of exploring um, the deeper parts of my being and um, honored them a lot. And when I came to my guru in India, he said, you use that yogi medicine? And I said, well, I have. I heard that he meant LSD. He said, do you have any of it? I said, yeah. So I brought it out and he took 900 micrograms, which three pills, which is a very powerful dose for a human being. And he went like that. And I thought, I mean, I'm a scientist, you know, and I thought this is going to be pretty interesting because <laughs> I have a healthy respect for this medicine and nothing happened at all. Because when you're in Detroit, you don't have to take a bus to Detroit. And um, so, but then I, I went home and I started talking about it and then I began to think maybe he clouded my mind and he threw it over his shoulder and I just thought he put it in his mouth. So when I went back to India in 1971, um, he called me up one day and he said, did you give me some medicine when you were here last time? I said, yeah. He said, did I take it? I said, well, I think so. He said, what happened? I said, nothing. Oh, got any more of that medicine? I said, yeah. So I brought it out and there were five pills, each 300, and he took four of them because one was broken. That was 1,200 microns. And he took each one and he put it on his tongue to make sure I saw because he knew my mind. And, and he said, can I take water? I said, yeah. And he said, hot or cold? It doesn't matter. He said, will it make me crazy? I said, probably. And <laughs> one point he went under his blanket and he came up looking mad, you know, like, and I thought, what have I done to this poor old man? He didn't realize how powerful our medicine was. And at the end, he just laughed at me. Nothing happened. And he said, these medicines were known about thousands of years ago in the Kulu Valley, but he said, that's all been forgotten now. And he said, they're useful. They could allow you to come in and, and visit with the Holy Spirit, but you can only stay two hours and then you've got to leave again. He said, it would be better to become the Spirit than visit with it, but your medicine won't help you do that, which I heard that. And I said to him, should I ever take this stuff anymore? And he said, if you're alone and you're feeling much peace and your mind is turned towards God, it could be useful. In other words, as a sacrament. And I feel that psychedelics or tryptamines have been very uh, much uh, maligned by linking them to coke and crack and heroin and all that. They're very different than that. They have been misused, but they also have a potential to be of great value to the society. And I hope someday we have a more conscious way of looking at these chemicals. I take LSD maybe once every two years to see what I forgot. And also because I'm a member of an explorer's club and I have to keep up my membership, sort of. Uh, I really feel that different people at different stages of their life have different agendas and that young people really, you have to become somebody before you should try to become nobody. And that getting your act together socially, sexually, intellectually, um, educationally, relationships, all that, first seems to be a useful step before you start to do kind of inner exploration, whether it's anything, meditation or anything. Because people I notice who try to become nobody before they're fully somebody end up losing their ground a little bit. They don't quite have good ground. And so there is a timing in it. So I don't really encourage people too young to do too much too soon. But otherwise, I'll just say the truth about it, even though people say, you shouldn't talk about drugs that way. It's, I guess I've got to, because it's my truth. Questions? Wait a minute, yeah. Uh, the positive and negative, 
are a struggle so long as you yourself have not transcended dualism, uh, uh, the polarizations. It's like if you go back in yourself to the one that lies behind the two, then you see that for the one to manifest as anything, come into form, it has to come into positive and negative energy, dark, light, good, evil, male, female, all that has to happen. Otherwise, there's no manifestation. It just stays unmanifest. And so whether or not you get stuck in the good and evil or the dark or light depends on where you are in relation to dualism. If you start to root yourself in the one, then the two is more like the play of forces and you find yourself aligning yourself with the good or the light or that which brings things back into the one, because that's what the good does. It brings it up into the one, and the dark brings it down into the separateness. And you find yourself aligning out of the one. Before I first experienced transcendence or knew that I had experienced transcendence, because most everybody experiences transcendence all the time, but they're busy labeling it as irrelevant. That's what happens most of the time. But before I really recognized that part of me that was not separate, I think I had a lot of trouble with good and evil. And I was busy being righteous and frightened about evil. I'm not any longer frightened about these things. Yes, sir. Well, yes, he said that um, at one time he saw uh, people that were caught in darkness or in evil as very devoted children of God that whose faith was so strong they were not afraid to explore evil. For example, in the Hindu story of the Ramayana, which is where the name Ram comes from and Hanuman and all that, the bad guy is called Ravana, and the bad guy is actually a very high yogi who's just running through a birth where he's a bad guy. And it's interesting because we in the West see bad guys as bad guys, but when you see the soul, it's like me and Casper. I mean, I'm not saying Casper's a bad guy, but you've got to see behind the veils all the time. And I could imagine that some beings who are caught in evil are high beings taking a heavy incarnation, like you suggest, and some good beings are high beings taking a good, in, and some people that are doing good are still very caught, and some people that are doing bad are very caught. I don't think that the highness is directly correlated to whether they're doing good or evil. I think you can do both. Yes. What is the significance of clairvoyant? You mean seeing what? What do you mean by that? Knowing that things will happen. Um, I think that it's um, that um, we have a very rigid set of rules about what we think is real based on what our senses tell us and what our thinking mind tells us. And we don't have really a very deep acceptance of those realms of law and reality that aren't immediately available to our thinking rational mind, but that are open to our intuitive mind. And I love miracles because they push everybody's buttons so much. I mean, like my guru, I, I wrote a book of a thousand stories about my guru, and um, called Miracle of Love. And um, like he, for example, I'll give you just a, I love them. Um, my guru's being shaved. He's at, a, uh, he's at a barber's. And the barber's lathered up his face and is shaving. And he shaved half of Maharaji's face. And during that time, he's telling Maharaji how his son, when the barber's son, went away 20 years ago. And he misses him terribly. He doesn't know where he is. And he needs him now because he's growing old. Maharaji stops him says, i got to go to the bathroom. He goes out around the back. He comes back after a couple of minutes. He sits down. The barber finishes shaving him. 
as Maharaji is leaving, the barber says, the Maharaji says to the barber, by the way, if it's God's will, maybe your son will come back. And he leaves. The next day, the son arrives. The barber says, what are you doing here? The son says, I don't know. It's very strange. He said, I am the manager at a hotel. In a, and he mentioned the town. It was about 150 miles away. He said, yesterday, I was standing at the desk in the lobby of the hotel. And this man rushed in. He had shaving cream on half his face. And he said, go home, go home. Your father needs you. And he rushed out again. See, <laughs> see now, you take a story like that and you think, you think I'm going to buy that one. You know, I mean, and I've collected a thousand of these things. And uh, after a while, when I've lived in India, in that world, I begun to allow a possibility. I was with a, um, a Nobel Prize winner, a fellow named uh, Feynman. Uh, in quantum mechanics, I guess. And um, I was telling him all these miracle stories. And I'd tell him one story and he'd say, yeah, that's possible. And I'd tell him another one and he'd say, yeah, that's possible. And he was really doing pretty well, I thought, till I told him about one where Maharaji appeared in two places at once. And he said, no, that's not possible. <laughs> I said, why not? He said, well, he said, if I accept that, the whole basis of what physics is is, is gone. I said, well, you have a problem. Okay. And it's the question of how far each person will stretch as to where they'll stop. And they'll say, well, I can't go any further. I'll draw the line there. Questions? I'll read you one story, just because I like to read this story every night. I would miss it if I didn't read it. This is a story told by um, Larry Brilliant, who was a, um, the doctor that started the Safer Foundation. My wife had met Maharaji and had come to get me in America and bring me back to meet him. When we first went to see Maharaji, I was put off by what I saw. All these crazy Westerners wearing white clothes and hanging around this fat old man in a blanket. More than anything else, I hated seeing Westerners touch his feet. On my first day there, he totally ignored me. But after the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh day, during which he also ignored me, I began to grow very upset. I felt no love for him. In fact, I felt nothing. I decided that my wife had been captured by some crazy cult. By the end of the week, I was ready to leave. We were staying at the hotel up in Nanital, and on the eighth day, I told my wife I wasn't feeling well. I spent the day walking around the lake, thinking of that if my wife was so involved in something that was clearly not for me, it must mean that our marriage was at an end. I looked at the flowers, the mountains, the reflections in the lake, but nothing could dispel my depression. Then did, I did something I'd never really done in my adult life. I prayed. I asked God, what am I doing here? Who is this man? These people are all crazy. I don't belong here. Just then I remembered the phrase, hedgy but faith, you would not need miracles. Okay, God, I don't have any faith. Send me a miracle. I kept looking for a rainbow, but nothing happened. So I decided to leave the next day. The next morning, we took a taxi down to the temple to say goodbye. Although I didn't like Maharaji, I thought I'd just be very honest and have it out with him. We got to Kenshi before anyone else was there, and we sat in front of his wooden bed on the porch. Maharaji had not yet come out from inside the room. There was some fruit on the tucket, and one of the apples had fallen on the ground. So I bent over to pick it up. Just then, Maharaji came out of his room and stepped on my hand, <clears throat> pinning me to the ground. So there I was on my knees, touching his foot. In that position, I detested. How ludicrous. He looked down at me and he asked, where were you yesterday? Were you at the lake? He said the word lake in English. When he said the word lake to me, I began to get this strange feeling at the base of my spine. My whole body tingled, it felt very strange. What were you doing at the lake? I began to feel very tight. Were you horseback riding? No. Were you boating? No. Did you go swimming? No. Then he leaned over and spoke very quietly to me. Were you talking to God? Did you ask for something? When he did that, I fell apart and started to cry like a baby. He pulled me over, started pulling my beard, repeating, Did you ask for something? Did you ask for something? 
That really felt like my initiation. By then, others had arrived, and they were around me, caressing me, and I realized then that almost everyone there had gone through some experience like that, a trivial question such as, were you at the lake yesterday, which had no meaning to anyone else, shattered my perception of reality. After that, I just wanted to rub his feet. <laughs> yes. Well, the question she's asking is about cultivating that part of the mind that notices or witnesses the whole processes you're going in, and how do you cultivate that? There are a variety of ways of cultivating it. There are many formal meditation techniques that are designed to do that. For example, just the simple thing of watching the breath is one of them. Watching the breath go in and out of the nose or watching it in the abdomen and, and starting to do it as a concentration exercise. For example, you sit down and you start to follow the breath rising and falling. And you will notice that the mind won't stay there, that it will immediately create It'll really, it's not creating thoughts. The thoughts are there, but it'll, the thoughts, each thought goes, Psst, think me, I'm real. See? And it invites you to think. And you, so you're sitting there, falling, rising, falling, rising, falling. And then a thought comes, this will never work. See, and it's a thought. And usually, if you buy into all your thoughts, you say, right, it'll never work, goodbye. See? But if you just agree that for 20 minutes, all you're going to do is follow that breath. No big deal. Don't get uptight about it. Just try, because it's going to be very hard to do. Then every time the mind wanders, you just very gently recollect it and bring it right back to the breath. And then it'll go away again. It'll say, like, my knee hurts, or I'm hungry, or is it 20 minutes over yet? Or, And the one that really sucks you in is, I think it's happening. That's when, you know, you sort of feel like something's happening. And you get so that you can see the mind going out and coming back and going out and coming back. And after a while, you learn how to bring your mind back to a place from which you can watch the rest of it happening. Now, that's a formal technique of meditation. But just the idea of learning how to witness is, is this. If, um, just make sure I'm not, okay. If, um, like if you're feeling depression, and I say to you, are you depressed? And you say, yeah, I'm really depressed. Are you completely, de yeah, I'm completely depressed. Really full, yo, yeah, I'm really depressed. I've been depressed for weeks. All of you, yeah. Are you noticing you're depressed? Yes. Tell me, is the noticer depressed? Well, the noticer is just noticing. Aha. That's where it is. It's as if, let's try another image. You have um, a cloud in the sky. You have a cloud, a painting of a cloud, but you got a frame that was too small. So when you put it on, you bend the canvas around, all you've got is gray. You don't even know it's a cloud, it's just gray. But if you put a little bigger frame on, you see the edge of blue sky and you say, ah, cloud. So what you need then is to cultivate the context in which you can see that it's a cloud. That's what you're doing. That's this whole business of witness. The witness is cultivating that part of you that is the sky so that you can watch the clouds come and go. Now, the way you start to do that is, it's as if, it's like the man who is imprisoned in a tower and his wife wants to help him escape. So she brings some food, which is, has a jar of honey in it, and they send it up to him, and the jailers bring it to him, and then he drips the honey over the side wall, outside, all the way down, and then she takes a beetle with a little black thread on it, and the beetle starts to eat the honey and climb. And the beetle gets to the top, and he pulls on the little black thread, and then the, the husband, and then the wife attaches a string to the thread, and he pulls the thread till he gets the string. And then when he's got the string, she attaches a rope to the string, and he pulls the string till he gets the rope. Then he ties the rope around one of the bars, and he climbs down and escapes. That's roughly the way it works. You start out with a little teeny thread. Most of you is completely caught in the drama of your life. And you look around to find that tiny bit of you that is just noticing the whole thing. And at first it's like one-tenth of one percent. 
all the rest of you is completely happy, sad, eager, de de depressed, all that stuff. And then after a while, when you really want to get free, you keep cultivating that, and it goes from one-tenth of a percent to a percent to two, till pretty soon it's about, like for me, it's about 50%. 50% of the time, I'm getting caught out in the world, and the other 50% of the time, I'm back inside, just noticing this whole thing. And I keep going in and out, and in and out. And after a while, they almost become simultaneous. You're out, and at the same moment, you're in. And that's just a process you go through very, very slowly. So that's a technique. Okay? These are all just different techniques. Okay. Um, there are around us many, many, many levels of reality, and there are many beings on these levels, and many of these beings are available to guide us. And what we need is what we get. And as each of us, it's the way, it's just the same thing, is as you change your consciousness, you become, it's like you retuned you as a receiver, and you are receptive to different levels of reality. It's like one of my teachers said, when a pickpocket meets a saint, all he sees are his pockets. Because your mind is so preoccupied with pockets, that's all you see. And in the same way, you probably could walk by, uh, you know, some of the greatest beings in the world, the uh, Christ and the Buddha, and you just walk by and, excuse me, and you walk right by. And unless they came up and said, hey, or they look like the pictures or something like that, you'd miss it because you're not tuned to those vibrations. And part of it is, as you keep purifying and quieting, you are more receptive to those beings and to the ways in which they guide you. So it's, it's an interactive thing. It's as, as you purify, you're, it's as if your purification calls out and demands that attention from them and draws you towards it. Everybody doesn't have a guru or a physical plane guide. Many people have inner guides that they experience as their inner voice, which could be their inner voice or it could be another being helping them. Or There are many levels of this game. Each person gets their karmapans. They get just what they need, just when they need it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I don't either. It's all right. Three questions are the nature of God, what he expects from me, and why does there seem to be so much blind suffering? Uh, uh, the, the, the first question, there is no satisfactory answer to the nature of God because there is, God is, in a way, uh, embraces all nature, all natures, if you will, so that you would say that from my point of view, see, I don't, the second question shows the way you are thinking of God in a dualistic framework as somebody separate from yourself. I don't experience that. I experience God as, it's be a, that's a shorthand word for the law, for example, as Plato said it. Not man law, but the natural law of forms of the universe, the way all forms exist and are related. Plato says that would be the way you would understand God through the law. And you would see that's the manifestation of the formless into form. So that all forms are, in a way, this is all part of God from that non-dualistic place, okay? So then the question is, where are we in that scheme of things, which is what does God expect? It would be that same way. And I would say that um, at the level at which we are asleep, we experience ourselves as separate from God and trying hard to be in grace or come to God or awaken into it. 
When we awaken, we realize that we and God are the same thing. There's, it's only one thing in the universe. It's the statement that's in the Old Testament. Um, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And it's not like one plus you, it's one. It's one that includes everything. And it's not, it doesn't mean just many gods and one God, it means there is only one thing. And that's the, exper the direct experience you have when you transcend your own mind, which keeps you feeling separate all the time. So that um, my sense is that um, what my job is as an incarnate is to awaken to becoming one with all of it, and then I become an instrument of all of that into the universe. In other words, I become a conduit through which the truth or that higher truth manifests on this plane. That becomes my function. Right? Now, um, the question is, why is there so much blind suffering? You've got to be careful, just like when I talked about my stepmother, you've got to be careful as to where you're looking at it from. Because, as I said before, and this is the hard one, that suffering is grace at some level. That suffering is a vehicle through which people awaken. And then you say, well, what about a kid that's starving to death, that doesn't have any desire to come to God, that just is hungry and dies? And then I would say, you would have to stand back far enough. And this is, sounds like rationalization and blind faith. And I can only say it from my own experience when I'm, where I feel it. That when you stand back far enough, you, and look at, in a way, incarnations. See, there's where reincarnation sneaks in. Because as long as you think that this life is all there is, and when you die, you're dead, then it stinks. It seems very unfair and very rotten. When you have experienced that you are not your body, and that the bodies go through processes, and you see a human life as a stage of evolution, then you could understand an entire life of suffering as part of that process of awakening for that individual, for that spiritual entity. So you can see what's rooted in an ability to accept that has to do with reincarnation, or it has to do with sensing that the being is more than the body, because there's no way you'd be satisfied that there's a benevolent God or even a a thoughtful consciousness in the whole scene if you just take a human birth and that's all you got. Okay. For a philosophical materialist, there's no way out. There's no, it stinks. That's what it boils down to. Excuse me, yes? We've well, got to stop in two minutes, yeah. Um, your husband is just in the form of your husband this round. However, you and that being may be connected from all through the whole cycle. That's entirely possible, but you would keep meeting in different forms from a reincarnational point of view. In other words, you wouldn't keep meeting as wife and husband. Maybe the next time you'll be husband and that'll be wife or brothers or who knows what else. You keep meeting in forms. You get a sense when you meet somebody that you've known them before and you treat that as, well, that's just a thing. But if you really tune, you often feel like you are a very deep friend of another being, but you're meeting them in a way that's unfamiliar to you. And what is described is that at the moment of death, you see your loved ones, if you will, in the essence form, in the way you know them behind all the forms, because the husbandness is only the form through which you're knowing at this time. But the essence, it's like when people die, when a partner dies, when you are a materialist, you really think they went. When you quiet down, you begin to sense where did they go, that the love you had for them wasn't a form that what went was the form, but the essence is still there. And people, once they quiet down, realize nobody went anywhere. That's the whole, uh, and they're just missing the form. 
I also want to say that re reincarnation is a hype. I mean, it's now that I've said that it's all real, it is as real as this is. If you think this is real, then that's real. If once you see this is more of the dream stuff, then that's the dream stuff too. Because when you finally awaken back into the one, you realize you never went anywhere and nothing happened anyway. The whole thing was just like a little dream your mind was playing. So it's dreams within dreams within dreams. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for us to stop. And this turns back into a pumpkin. Um, it feels to me like it is incredible grace that you and I live with enough food in our bellies and enough shelter and for all of its impurities in a political system that allows us to come together and do this. And this is in the history of humankind, this is very rare, that people have the time and the opportunity and the political freedom to explore these issues of consciousness and it's not something we should feel guilty about because we are privileged, but rather to honor that's our one of our parts to play and that we work on ourselves to offer it back into the world because the more peaceful, the more compassion, that's what we offer back in. But it just feels incredibly graceful that you and I can play this part. In India, when we meet and part, we say namaste, which means, one of the ways of saying it is, I honor that place in you where when you're in yours and I'm in mine, there's only one of us. Namaste. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.